Hello, and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn, Beat, Foot, and Ankle Ailments. I'm Dr. Steve Reinches, the President and CEO of North Kent City Hospital and Meritas Health. Thank you for joining us. The nature of being on our feet all day combined with our various activities can add up to a variety of foot and ankle ailments. Thankfully, many new beneficial treatments are available. Our expert speaker today is Dr. Angela Walker, who is an orthopedic surgeon with Orthopedic Surgeons, Inc. Dr. Walker is the only female fellowship-trained foot and ankle specialist in the Northland and one of only a handful in our entire city. She'll discuss common conditions, prevention, non-operative, and surgical solutions to get you back on track. Dr. Walker earned her medical degree from Kansas City University, completed her residency in orthopedic surgery at St. Mary's Medical Center in Blue Springs, and was a fellow in foot and ankle surgery at the University of California, Los Angeles Medical Center. She served as a team physician for FCKC, Kansas City's women's professional soccer team, and she's previously coached and played basketball and softball. If you have any questions about foot and ankle issues, submit your questions using the Q&A app. We'll respond at the end of Dr. Walker's presentation. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Walker. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me, Dr. Reinches. It's nice to be here. Um, today, we're going to chat about some common foot and ankle issues that probably some of the most common ones that I see pop up in my clinic. Uh, we'll talk about um, what it is. Uh, what we do to treat it non-operatively, and then also some surgical uh, solutions for you along the way. Um, so let's start with just a normal uh, ankle. And the, the bones there are, as you can see, the fibula is that small bone on the outside. Uh, the tibia is your main shin bone. And then that bottom bone is called the talus. So those three bones make up the uh, ankle joint itself. Uh, there's ligaments on the outside, inside, and then also between the tibia and the fibula. The ones on the outside are called the anterior talofibular ligament and the calcaneofibular ligament. Those are the ones that are most commonly torn or stretched anytime we uh, roll our ankle. Uh, the deltoid ligament is on the very inside part of the ankle. And then the ligaments between the two bones, the tibia and the fibula, make up what's called the syndesmosis. There's actually three ligaments to the syndesmosis, and those are very important when we're talking about uh, stability to the ankle and the setting of uh, fracture. Um, so that, for, for future reference, try and keep that picture in your brain as to what a normal ankle may look like on an x-ray. Um, so the most, I would say probably one of the most common injuries that I see in my clinic is an ankle sprain. Um, it's usually caused from an inversion type injury on a plantar flex foot or with when the foot is pointing downward. And you can imagine those ligaments on the outside part of the ankle get stretched or torn to varying degrees. Um, patients with, with ankle sprains, they usually know when it happened. They they stepped off of a curb uh, or they were playing basketball or something and they twisted or landed on somebody's foot and their foot immediately rolled in. That's the usual history that we get. Um, they usually, sometimes they'll go to an urgent care or an emergency department first uh, and rule out any type of fracture. If there's nothing fractured. They usually end up in my uh, clinic for further evaluation and treatment. Uh, people that have ankle sprains usually present with pain, swelling, um, bruising, and usually some stiffness can come along with this. Um, as you get in the later stages of chronic ankle sprains, uh, people will sometimes present with uh, actual instability to the ankle where they, they feel like they don't trust their ankle or they can't walk on uneven ground without um, rolling it again. Um, so the non-operative management for ankle sprains consists of the usual things. We, I, I, most of us have probably heard of the RICE protocol. Uh, rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Uh, sometimes we'll use a, a boot or a brace for a short period of time. Um, I usually put people into a boot if they come to see me. I usually put them in that for at least a couple of weeks until the initial bruising, swelling, and all that uh, starts to subside and their pain gets better. Um, I'm quick to start people in physical therapy with ankle sprains as well because it does have a definite benefit of um, getting you back into your activities, your normal level of, of function quicker. 
Um, I, most ankle sprains do just fine uh, without surgery. So in the setting that you come see me for or anybody for an ankle sprain, uh, usually we will get you treated uh, conservatively. And then I don't even consider getting an MRI or anything until about three months down the road because most ankle sprains will have resolved on their own by then. Um, so let's say a patient comes back and it's been three months, they're still having significant pain to the ankle um, where, they, where they say they can't trust it. Uh, they walk on uneven ground and it wants to give out or roll on them. Uh, in that setting, I'll usually get an MRI at that point and we'll further evaluate the ligaments of the ankle. Um, on that right-handed x-ray, uh, you can actually see, so if you remember that first picture where the joint space was nice and congruent, you can actually see on that x-ray on the right hand, that outside part between the, the small bone, the fibula, um, and the talus down below, it actually starts to widen out with some stress. Um, so that is an inherently unstable ankle because those ligaments got torn or stretched at one point. Um, so those ligaments are chronically damaged. And in those situations, actually a, a surgical procedure is very successful in tightening those ligaments back up and getting the patient back to their normal function. Um, sometimes on the MRI, we'll actually see damage to cartilage within the ankle. And in that case, we'll actually do an arthroscopic type procedure where we use some small instruments to look inside the ankle um, and we can either clean up the cartilage that's damaged or there's some um, uh, procedures that we can do to try and restore that damaged cartilage, especially in our younger patients. Um, and then the ligament reconstruction is where we actually, we actually take the ligaments off and then we reconstruct them at a, a tighter, um, uh, so that they're tighter and the ankle's more stable overall. Um, in my patients who are a little younger, we'll say, um, I think this procedure is very successful because it does prevent further damage or potential damage to that cartilage down the road. Um, so next uh, we'll talk a little bit about ankle arthritis. So ankle arthritis is, is similar to all other arthritis. Um, it's, it's the same wear and tear or damage to the cartilage that we see in knees and hips and shoulders um, and really any other joint throughout the body. Um, I've seen people that come into my uh, office with some of the most advanced arthritis I've ever seen, and I don't know how they deal with it for so long. Um, but what arthritis is in general is it's a damage to the cartilage at the joint space. Um, the body sees the damage and sends inflammatory uh, markers to that area. Um, sometimes they, people will actually form bone spurs. That's a calcium deposit that actually forms on the uh, ends of the joints. And then you'll see the difference between that left-handed x-ray and the right-handed x-ray. In that uh, B picture, the joint space is completely gone and there's no more cartilage and the bones are essentially rubbing on one another. And that's what we call, quote, bone on bone um, arthritis. So there's a few different types of arthritis in general. Um, the most common that we see in the ankle is called post-traumatic arthritis or after an injury. So uh, people who break their ankle are going to be more prone to getting arthritis down the road, sometimes at an earlier uh, rate than an older or, uh, somebody who hasn't broken their ankle before. Also, people who have that kind of chronic instability to the ankle, they are also going to be more prone to developing arthritis at an earlier rate down the road. Um, so that's the most common variety that we see. There's also um, just your normal wear and tear arthritis uh, called primary osteoarthritis. And then there are other conditions that are more systemic, um, such as rheumatoid arthritis and things like that. Um, but we won't go into those today. Um, so people, when they come to see me for ankle arthritis, they've a lot of times been dealing with pain for even several years before. Uh, they will sometimes lose range of motion because of those bone spurs that form on the ends of the bones. Um, and then they have pain with weight bearing, usually worse with increased activities and things like that. So our conservative treatments for arthritis or ankle arthritis specifically are the same as for any other arthritis in the body. Um, activity modification or basically the old adage, if it hurts, don't do it, applies here. Um, bracing, sometimes an ankle brace can help just to immobilize the ankle, especially when they're doing uh, their normal daily activities or for exercise type activities. Um, Anti-inflammatories, if you're able to take those, such as ibuprofen, Aleve, uh, or even prescription strength ones can be helpful as well. Um, there's also a topical anti-inflammatory that's actually over the counter that sometimes people will use. 
uh, in the foot, I feel that it's going to have more effect there because there's not as much soft tissue overlying the foot structures as there are in other parts of the body, such as the hip or the knee or, and other places. Um, steroid injections are also quite helpful for treating ankle arthritis. Uh, generally, we can do these about every three months uh, if the patient wishes to try and avoid surgery. <clears throat> so beyond um, non-operative management for ankle arthritis, we have essentially two surgical options. Um, one is a ankle arthritis, or sorry, an ankle arthroplasty or a joint replacement, and then the other is called a fusion. Uh, so that top, those top two x-rays are actually an ankle replacement. So it's very similar to a knee replacement and the fact that there's metal up top, there's metal on the bottom, and then there's a plastic piece between the two. And that's the actual new bearing surface for the ankle joint. Um, <clears throat> ankle arthroplasty or joint replacement is not perfect for everybody. Um, I will say it's actually uh, not as well used in the younger patients, although we are trending more towards using it in uh, younger people. Um, because the bone stock or the, the amount of bone that we're actually working with, if, if, if that total ankle does not work or it starts to wear out, our options are quite limited uh, when we have to or, or if we have to potentially revise that surgery. So um, generally your ankle uh, replacements are going to be better suited for actually our older um, patients and people without significant deformity. So I don't know if you remember that first x-ray that we saw, the ankle was nice and congruent all the way around. The, the talus will sometimes start to actually tilt one way or the other. And if you have any significant deformity to the ankle, then sometimes an ankle um, replacement's not gonna be the best option for you. So beyond the ankle replacement, um, we have a uh, ankle fusion is actually the next option. So a fusion in general is where we prepare the bones and the joint surface in such a way so that those bones will actually start to grow together and, and integrate over time. Um, and so those bottom two x-rays down there are actually a picture of an ankle fusion that is uh, at least a couple of years uh, out of surgery now, and those bones have grown together. Uh, the hardware is nice and stable. So what you're trading with a joint um, fusion versus the replacement is I'm actually trading the patient motion for pain relief is essentially what it is. But this is going to be um, sometimes better suited to our younger patients with very advanced arthritis or anybody that's got sort of that deformity that's starting to form uh, where the, the ligaments and the other supporting structures of the ankle are going to be less stable. Um, so we're actually, um, we're actually stabilizing the ankle with bony um, fixation rather than relying on the surrounding soft tissues. Uh, ankle fracture. I could talk about ankle fractures for a really long time because they're all different and uh, not, not any two ankle fractures are the same. Uh, there's a multitude of different ways that people break the ankle, uh, but most commonly it is sort of going to be a twisting type injury similar to the ankle sprain, um, but usually it's going to be a little bit more severe so that the bones actually break and it's not just a ligament that's torn. Um, so the um, it can be from a high uh, energy trauma, such as a motor vehicle accident, or even just a low energy where somebody uh, stepped on a stair uh, or, or stepped off of a stair wrong, or even tripped on a curb wrong um, can, be as, can be enough to break an ankle. Um, sometimes people will have immediate deformity to the ankle where things just don't look right. And the ankle seems like it's out of place. Uh, people will have a significant amount of pain and swelling and bruising. Uh, sometimes if the swelling is so much, the skin will actually start to blister around that. Um, and in those cases, we have to wait usually at least a couple of weeks before we can uh, get around to fixing these because of the, the soft tissue envelope. Um, usually you're not going to be able to wait bear very well on a broken ankle, especially if it's unstable like this one on the x-ray that we have where they've actually broken the inside part as well as the outside part of the ankle. Um, so... Again, when people break their ankle, they usually end up at an urgent care or an, an emergency department. Uh, we'll get x-rays while you're there. And usually you get placed into like a splint for um, at least a few days and then follow up in the outpatient setting. Some people who don't have help at home will sometimes actually need admitted to the hospital after an ankle fracture um, because they can't get around and they just need extra help. Um, so if, if you do have that significant deformity to the ankle when you come into the emergency department, sometimes they will actually sedate you in the emergency department 
put it back into a better position so that there's no um, pressure on the skin and then put you into a splint and then we treat you in the out or from the outpatient setting usually. Um, so non-operative management of ankle fractures is usually only reserved for a, a, a small subset of patients. Um, so the A, B, and C down there on the bottom, uh, those are three different types of fibula fractures. So the small bone on the outside, uh, the type A and B, sometimes those are, those are going to be more inherently stable than the type C fractures. So when the, when the fibula breaks a little bit higher than and those other two, those are the ones that are usually going to be more uh, ones that we're going to fix surgically. So like I said, not any two um, ankle fractures are the same um, and they all get treated a little bit differently. So for those A and B type fractures where uh, you can potentially treat them non-operatively, uh, we can either use honestly a cast or a boot for those, um, but sometimes you'll usually you'll be off of these for about six weeks afterwards. Um, so I would plan to be in at least a, a cast or a boot for that amount of time off of it using crutches or a, a rolling walker or something like that um, for about six weeks. And then you can actually start walking on it at that point um, in a, usually in a boot uh, by then. So um, our operative management for ankle fractures, uh, I would say most ankle fractures uh, we generally fix. So especially ones that have breaks in two different, two or three different places. Um, so that one up top, the, where they broke the outside and the inside part, we usually fix those with a variety of plates and screws. Um, it's called an open reduction internal fixation is the big fancy term for it. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different theories and ways to fix ankle fractures. So again, it's going to be very surgeon specific and, and kind of based on what your surgeon preference is. Um, but what the open reduction internal fixation is, is we make an incision, we put the bones back into the place where they're supposed to be, and then we fixate them with a variety of plates and screws. Um, so those plates and screws are there to hold everything until your body actually heals the fracture on its own. Uh, once the fracture is completely healed, the hardware is honestly just in there for show on an x-ray, if you will. Uh, because the bones is the bone actually heals just as strong as it was before it actually broke. Um, on rare occasions with this external fixation, so those that picture on the bottom right hand, um, sometimes we actually have to use pins and wires that actually stick out of the skin to hold everything in in position until the skin swelling. Sometimes when people have those blisters, we have to wait a couple weeks at least before we can actually take them to surgery. The risk that you take if you go to surgery a little bit too soon uh, with these is that you can end up with a wound complication um, and things like that that nobody wants to have to deal with. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is an Achilles tendon rupture. Um, so again, this is a sudden, it's actually a forced dorsiflexion. So when the, the toes come up this way um, and you're not quite ready for it, I guess. So your typical story with this is going to be your weekend warrior uh, or somebody honestly my age that thinks that they can still play basketball or something at the age or at the same level that they used to uh, goes out and plays on a Saturday. The typical story that I hear is they were playing, they uh, stepped and felt like somebody kicked them is what I'll usually have them say, but then they look back and there was nobody there that that was even around. Uh, so there's usually an audible pop. They will feel a pop uh, and they have immediate pain swelling. Uh, so usually people also end up in the ER or the urgent care with these injuries as well. X-rays will usually not show a whole lot because it's a soft tissue injury. Um, so when they come into me, there's usually a palpable gap in the rupture area uh, with your more chronic type injuries. So someone that's been dealing with a chronic Achilles rupture uh, over three or four months. Uh, they will sometimes have actually some atrophy or some wasting to that calf muscle too. Um, treatment for acute versus chronic Achilles ruptures is a little bit different, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, so picture A there on the left-hand side, uh, you can actually see there's kind of a palpable or a defect within the skin back there. They have some swelling around the back part of the ankle. Um, and then B is one that is going to be fixed surgically. You'll see that the tendon edges are actually kind of frayed and kind of looks like a, a bow stringing or something like that. Um, or kind of like spaghetti, if you will. So that's what a Achilles tendon rupture actually looks like when you get in there. 
Um, so non-operative management. So um, there is actually a lot of debate on uh, what to do with Achilles tendon ruptures. Do you fix them acutely? Do you let them heal? Um, people who choose the non-operative management. So anybody who's in general, anybody who's diabetic or a tobacco user, um, I, I generally don't operate on those patients because of a risk of wound healing complications. Um, that area of skin there in the back part of the ankle is, it does not like to be messed with. And those patients are very prone to wound issues. Again, a wound that nobody wants to see or deal with. Um, so uh, in those patients, I will usually get them immobilized and for at least a couple of weeks, kind of like the, the ankle sprain patient. And then we get them into a functional rehab type protocol. Um, <clears throat> So a lot of physical therapy is usually involved with that. There are actually some recent studies out now that show equivalent outcomes with non-surgical versus surgical management. Uh, so that's a discussion that I have with every patient that tears their Achilles. Um, do you wanna have surgery? I can give you the risks and benefits of both and we can move forward in an informed way that, work, that makes sense for both of us. Um, so operative management of Achilles tendon ruptures. Uh, there's again, multiple different techniques out there on, um, how to fix these. Some people will make a big open incision and actually put a bunch of sutures through them and then tie the two ends together. Um, more, uh, I guess more modern type techniques are kind of moving in a minimally invasive way where we make small incisions and then we use a special, uh, surgical device to actually pass sutures through the tendon. And then we, can pull those tendons through kind of the bottom part and then we actually can anchor it into the heel bone. And that's what that picture is showing. Uh, there's actually a couple of anchors there in the back part of the heel where we've anchored those sutures into the bone. Um, benefits to fixing Achilles tendon uh, ruptures acutely uh, are, the biggest risk is again, the wound, even in a young health, healthy patient, you can end up with um, a surgical wound. Um, the benefits of early operative management are um, generally they have less weakness. There's a little bit less, le uh, less risk of re-rupture of the tendon. Um, and those are kind of the biggest things. That, and, and I can also get patients into therapy a little bit quicker and get them moving a little bit faster uh, and get them back to their normal activities. Uh, so there are other procedures. So those chronic Achilles tendon ruptures that I was referring to, um, they are gonna be more for the patients who have been dealing with these injuries and these tears for several months. And we can actually take a tendon that flexes the big toe down and put that into the heel bone to give them some strength back. Um, so those are kind of fun procedures, but those are more for your chronic kind of tendon reconstruction type things. Uh, so Achilles tendonitis is also a very common injury that I see or a common ailment that people are dealing with. Um, so there's two main types of Achilles tendonitis. One is called insertional. The other is called non-insertional. So insertional, if you can imagine, is actually where the Achilles tendon comes down and attaches onto the heel bone. That x-ray on the left-hand side there actually shows a bone spur that's formed at that tendon attachment. And then there's a small kind of prominence on the back part of the heel bone there. That's called a Haglund deformity. Um, so these patients will present usually with pain directly at that attachment site. Sometimes they'll actually have a, a prominence back there that you can feel on the skin. And then some people will get almost a bursitis over the top part of that. They usually have issues wearing, um, wearing tennis shoes and anything that kind of pushes on the back part of that heel there. So a lot of times they'll walk in with Crocs or flip-flops and things like that because they don't have that pressure on the back part of the heel. Um, Non-insertional Achilles tendonitis is a little bit higher than that. Um, so it is important to differentiate those two because the treatment, the non-operative treatments are very similar, but the operative treatments are different if we ever get to that discussion. So non-insertional is about three or four centimeters above that attachment point. People will also have uh, swelling within the tendon. It's called fusiform swelling. Uh, so it's an area of tendon that actually kind of bulges out, if you will, again, proximal to that attachment point. Um, Sometimes people will describe a burning type sensation. They'll have that swelling. Um, and a lot of times with tendonitis issues, they'll have some stiffness, uh, usually first thing in the morning. But then as they get warmed up and kind of get going with their day, the, the stiffness and things get a little bit better. Uh, so that's kind of a hallmark of tendonitis in general. 
So non-operative management for, again, for both types, non-insertional versus insertional. Uh, again, activity modification, shoe wear modification, such as a heel lift can help. Um, so just lifting the heel up about a centimeter or so takes a little bit of uh, attention off of that attachment point and can help uh, relieve some pain. Uh, and I'm a big therapy proponent for Achilles tendonitis as well. Um, I get people into their, that's usually my first line treatment is getting them into physical therapy. Again, your anti-inflammatories, if you can take them, the topical works quite well, quite well on the back part of the ankle there um, as well, again, because there's not a lot of soft tissue to cover uh, the actual Achilles tendon. Sometimes oral steroids can help, but never an injection into the Achilles because that can actually weaken the Achilles and cause a rupture. So that's a big no-no. Um, and then the typical rest, ice compression, and elevation protocol. Uh, there, is a, there is one injection you can use for Achilles tendonitis. It's called a platelet-rich plasma injection. Uh, so what that is, is it's essentially using your own body's uh, healing elements to try and heal the Achilles tendon and decrease inflammation and pain. So we actually take a, a draw of your own blood. Uh, we spin that down in a, in a uh, centrifuge, if you will, and then it separates the red blood cells, so the red parts of the blood from the yellow parts of the plasma parts of the blood. And then we take that plasma portion of the blood, it usually ends up about three or four millimeters or uh, milliliters, and then we can actually inject that into the area. So the idea behind that is to create an inflammatory response in the body so that the body recognizes that there's an area of inflammation and then sends um, things to heal that. Um, so it's trying to use your own biology to try and heal these things. Um, the idea behind that is not necessarily to cure it or to get rid of any bump, but to decrease inflammation and pain. And it's been quite successful in, in a few patients that I've used it on. Um, so with Achilles tendonitis, I treat this usually for a minimum of six months to a year before we ever consider surgery. Um, so operative management for Achilles tendonitis, again, it kind of just varies between which, um, which one you're dealing with. Um, so the insertional usually involves us actually having to take the bone spur off and remove a portion of the, uh, the calcaneus or the heel bone, kind of that, um, that haglin deformity, that bump. So we actually detach the Achilles tendon, kind of clean up everything in there, and then we reattach it with, with specialized anchors and sutures. Um, Again, tendon transfers for your more chronic type issues that you're dealing with. Uh, for the non-insertional, sometimes, again, if they failed conservative therapies and everything else is not working, uh, we will actually take them to the operating room and open up over where that tendon is swollen, um, debride that area of the tendon, and then we close it back up with some sutures. And then sometimes we'll even put PRP in it at that time or the plate rich plasma in it at that time as well. Uh, so let's move on to some foot issues. Uh, so this is a very normal appearing foot on those x-rays. So kind of keep this picture ingrained in your brain as well. Uh, so there's um, four main bones to the hind foot. So one of them also makes up the ankle. So the talus is the, that bottom bone of the ankle. And then you got your calcaneus, your heel bone. And then there's two bones in front of the talus. One's called the navicular, the other's called the cuboid. Beyond that is the midfoot area. And then the metatarsals are those long bones. And then you've got your, your toes at the very end of your phalanges. Um, so this is a very normal appearing foot. There's no significant arthritis. There's no significant deformity. Um, joint spaces are well-maintained and they have a really nice arch that you can see on that uh, side view of the foot. Uh, so flat foot deformity, again, you could, you could talk for an hour just on this topic alone. Um, it used to be called posterior tibial tendon insufficiency. So the reason for that is the tendon on the inside part of the ankle and foot is called the posterior tibial tendon. That tendon has a few functions. One, it lifts you up onto your toes. It turns your toes inward. And it also acts sort of as the sling to the inside part of your arch. So if that tendon actually starts to wear out or tear, the arch will start to start to fall and you lose that sling to the inside part of your foot. And now it's called an adult flat foot deformity. Uh, so it's a three-dimensional deformity. It's quite complex. And it's probably one of the most difficult things that, in my opinion, that a foot and ankle surgeon can actually deal with on a surgical uh, basis. Um, so people will come in and they'll say, I've had flat feet my entire life. Well, those people are going to be a little bit more prone to having issues with that tendon uh, just because of the extra strain that it's been dealing with for many years. Um, <clears throat> 
if this deformity or this flat foot deformity is left untreated for, for a long time, it can actually cause severe midfoot arthritis and pain. So again, your midfoot is that portion there kind of in the, again, in front of the hind foot uh, between the metatarsals and those bigger bones in the back part of the foot. Um, again, non-operative management is the first line treatment for any sort of a flat foot deformity. Uh, I've actually seen kids in my practice, they come in and they just have naturally flat feet. Uh, and in those cases, you're just going to want to get them into a good supportive shoe with an arch support and make sure that they wear those essentially all the time, especially with their sports activities and things like that. Um, <clears throat> in general, uh, an over-the-counter arch support is going to be sufficient, uh, especially for people with very mild flat foot deformity. Um, your custom molded shoe orthotics, things like that are going to be for your more severe deformities, or sometimes we could get you fitted with what's called an ankle foot orthosis. So it actually uh, is an orthosis that immobilizes the ankle and the foot and can help correct deformities with certain wedges and things like that. Um, sometimes immobilization, if a person has a, an acute flare of pain, uh, immobilization can help for a short period of time until their pain gets a little bit better so they can get back into their normal activities. Um, so mild deformity, um, that's kind of your, that's your first line treatment for flat foot, uh, especially with mild deformity where the foot's still nice and, and we call it flexible. The joints still move very easily. Um, <clears throat> so operative management, there's again, a million different ways that you can treat this operatively. Uh, so if someone has very mild disease and the tendon uh, just appears inflamed on like an MRI, um, sometimes we can go in and just clean up the tendon a little bit uh, if they failed all the other non-operative measures. Um, beyond that, there's usually some sort of a foot reconstruction that we're going to talk to the patients about if they get to the point where they're talking about surgery. Um, it usually involves at least a cut in the heel bone and shifting it. Uh, versus these fusion type techniques. But the whole idea behind surgery for a flat foot deformity is to take that deformity that's, that's flattened out and actually realign the foot and make it so that it sits back underneath uh, the patient's leg better. Um, so it all depends on surgeon preference and uh, how severe the deformity is if the patient has any arthritis and things like that. Um, so I won't get into a ton of detail on this just because the, the treatment options are so different uh, when it comes to what a patient's actually going to be a candidate for surgically. Um, it's definitely a discussion to have with your individual surgeon. Um, bunion, also a very common uh, deformity that I see. I think we all know what a bunion is. It's a big bump on the inside part of the big toe. Um, but it's, I always talk to patients, it's more than just a bump on the toe. Um, it's actually a malalignment of the big toe where the, the first metatarsal or the big toe actually starts to drift inward. The soft tissues on the outside part of that big toe get tight. The ones on the inside get loose and then the toe starts to drift or the end of the toe starts to drift in the other direction. So it creates that bunion type deformity. Um, people will come to my clinic. They've, some people have had bunions their entire lives. I've seen very bad bunions or terrible looking bunions clinically and the patients don't have any pain with them. And in that case, I don't like to create pain where there's not pain. So I, I don't generally talk to those patients about surgery. Uh, your, your first line treatment with this is going to be uh, wide fitting shoes. So something that's actually wide enough to fit your foot where it's not gonna press on that bump. Um, and then a nice supportive shoe as well. Um, other people will cut, uh, we'll get in more of the, the um, treatment options here in a second. So a bunionette deformity, um, similar to a bunion, but it's not actually on the outside part of the foot. So uh, this patient on the x-rays here in the clinical uh, picture had both. Um, so on that the left hand uh, picture on that bottom left, you can see she has the bunion deformity, so the big bump on the inside, and then she also has a pretty prominent bump on the outside part of the foot as well. Uh, again, uh, people usually come in with pain with weight bearing or pain with uh, shoe wear. Uh, anything that presses on that area is painful. Uh, so non-operative management for both of these, again, you're going to want to get a wide fitting shoe um, and something that just doesn't press on that area. Um, otherwise, you actually do have to do a, a bony alignment. Um, sometimes bracing and uh, spacers for the big toes can help to kind of keep that toe a little bit straighter and keep it from rubbing on your other toes. 
Uh, so I'll talk to patients about uh, toe spacers at the same time. Uh, operative management um, for bunion and a bunionette, it usually involves a, a realignment of one or both of those um, bones. So on the, the bunion treatment, usually it involves a cut in that the big meta or the first metatarsal, the long bone and the big toe, an actual cut in that bone, and then we shift it back to where it, it needs to be realigned with the rest of the foot. And then there's some soft tissue uh, things that we can do to actually get the, the remainder of the toe straight. Um, Again, similar to a fracture, you cut the bone, you fix it with some screws, and then the screws hold it till your body actually heals. That is called an osteotomy or a cut in the bone. Um, bunionette deformity, uh, we usually, again, it's a realignment type procedure. Sometimes people will actually go in and shave off a, a portion of that metatarsal head that's sticking out, um, but usually it's a realignment type procedure. We actually make a cut in the bone and it, it shifts over the opposite direction of the the bunion. So um, hallux rigidus, also known as big toe arthritis. Uh, it's arthritis just like any other joint in the body, uh, but it is of the big toe. Uh, people, people usually come in with um, pain. Sometimes they'll have a bump on the top part of that toe. Um, and on that x-ray, you can see there's actually a bone spur on the top part of that metatarsal head. Uh, they've lost joint space and they usually cannot uh, dorsiflexor, their toe will not move up very well or very easily without significant pain. Um, sometimes the people will get some nerve irritation. There's some small nerves that run along the top part of that toe and the bone spur can actually rub on those and cause numbness, tingling, and pain as well. Um, Non-operative management for this is uh, for mild treatment. Um, uh, sometimes a steroid injection can help into the joint, uh, but you're not going to get rid of that bump without doing something surgically. That's never going to go away with just a, a conservative therapy. Um, so operative management, again, kind of depends on the, dis of the severity of the disease. Uh, something as simple as a bone spur removal from the top part of that joint can help um, just with shoe wear purposes. It doesn't fix the arthritis, but it can help with shoe wear. Um, Joint replacements, there are those options for the big toes. I personally don't do those because they are, they're not prone to working for long periods of time. Um, and then a joint fusion type procedure. So similar to the ankle where you're trading motion for pain relief, where we get those two bones to grow together. And those are those bottom two right x-rays. That person had a, a fusion. Plantar fasciitis, another one of the most common things that I see in my clinic. Uh, it's a inflammation of the plantar fascia aponeurosis of, or where that, that plantar fascia actually attaches onto the heel bone. Uh, it's caused by overuse and repetitive trauma. Uh, it creates micro tears in the tendon um, and or in the, the fascia. A lot of times people have pain first thing in the morning when they get out of bed because when you sleep, your toes generally go down and then you get up in the morning and you stretch everything out and it kind of re-injures or re-tears that tissue at the base of the uh, heel. Uh, people usually have pain on the bottom inside part of the heel. Uh, that's kind of the hallmark area. And then the pain first thing out of bed in the morning. Non-operative treatment. Again, I treat this six months to a year non-surgically uh, before we ever even consider surgical intervention. Uh, physical therapy is very important with this. Uh, home exercise program, stretching, um, heel inserts. So a nice soft cushion um, heel cup or something for your shoe can help with just uh, being more comfortable to walk on. Uh, sometimes night splints can help if a patient has a lot of pain first thing in the morning. Uh, keeping that foot at 90 degrees during the nighttime can help just keep everything stretched out. Steroid injections occasionally as well can help uh, with acute flares of pain and things like that. This is showing actually an ultrasound type device uh, that um, it's called like shockwave type therapy is what they refer to it as. Uh, and that's a non-operative treatment as well. Operative management for this, usually it involves uh, releasing a portion of the plantar fascia. So where that attachment point is onto the heel, we release that portion, it takes that tension off and then it heals in an elongated position and helps with the pain. Sometimes a lengthening of the calf muscle or the fascia over the calf muscle can help as well. <clears throat> um, diabetic foot, another thing I could talk about for an hour. Um, so, uh, people with neuropathy and, um, diabetic foot ulcers are probably one of the most, another, one of the most difficult things that we deal with. Uh, it's usually shark. 
the neuropathy can lead to this entity called Charcot foot deformity. Uh, this Charcot foot deformity, it's people will get, it's called a rocker bottom foot. So their arch, their arch actually starts like this and then their arch collapses so that they get this prominence on the bottom part of the foot. Uh, so Charcot is, is only in people with neuropathy, but obviously most common due to diabetes because diabetes is very common. Um, <clears throat> it's from a desensitization of the joints from the neuropathy or the nerves not working appropriately. Um, a lot of times it's painless. Uh, one of the most common things that I talk to my patients about with diabetic feet is just being very diligent, diligent about checking your feet every single day. Get a mirror, look underneath your foot, make sure you didn't step on something and you didn't know it. Make sure you're not developing a callus or an ulcer or something and you don't know that it's going on. Because um, I will have people come in and they, they've got an ulcer already and they didn't even know that it was there. Um, the thing we worry about with ulcers is not the ulcer itself, but infection secondary to that ulcer or getting an infection in the bone uh, that can sometimes actually lead to a baloney amputation, uh, which is not a desired outcome, obviously. Um, so again, prevention of this is going to be key. Uh, strict blood sugar control is critical. Um, maintaining a proper diet, getting on the right medications and keeping that A1C or those blood sugars down to a normal level. Again, daily foot inspection. So getting a mirror and just looking at the bottom of the foot every single day. Uh, weight loss can obviously help decrease some of the amounts of forces that are put on the foot. And then in these patients, I will actually send them quite frequently to get custom shoes and inserts made because the orthotic people can make, or the orthotists can actually make cutouts in the orthotic that will help offload pressure to any area of the foot that they need it. Um, so in general, prevention of foot issues, uh, be sure to warm up prior to any sports activity. Cross train for your specific activity as well. Uh, if you're a weekend warrior and you want to go out and play basketball on the weekend, do some stretches before you do so. It's not going to prevent everything, but it, you can do as much as you can, at least doing that. Um, wear appropriate shoes, wear nice supportive shoes, replace your shoes when they're necessary. If you have an issue with ankle instability or chronically rolling your ankle, uh, use caution when you're on uneven ground. Um, use braces if you need to. Most importantly, listen to your body and consult your physician or your orthopedic surgeon if you have any questions or concerns. And thank you. It's cute, baby. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was fascinating. I, uh, I think mm -hmm. about my own foot and ankle having spent 31 years in the operating room mm -hmm. and standing for hours and hours on end. I thought that was uh, a really telling uh, explanation of the, the chronic changes that happen to, to all of us, you know, yeah. depending on our anatomy and our health conditions. Yeah. So we have some uh, questions from yeah. the audience. Ready for some questions? Yeah. Question number mm -hmm. one, why do foot and ankle injuries take so long to heal? Um, so gravity doesn't help us with this. So the foot is obviously the most, the part that's closest to the ground. Uh, it's the furthest from the heart. Um, so one uh, swelling is always pulled to the foot uh, because of uh, just gravity in general. So they're going to be more prone to swelling. And then it's also furthest from your, your heart. So pumping blood and things to the area, um, that's, they can take a while. So, so that and we're on our feet all day, every day, right? So I have a question. <laughs> when I read about the joint replacements, you know, mm -hmm. we started with, in orthopedics with knee replacements and hip replacements and then shoulder replacements. And now we have ankle replacements and elbow replacements. When I first read about ankle replacements, uh, the the studies that I read is it would take 12 months to heal. Is that mm -hmm. correct for an ankle replacement? Uh, so we've evolved with technology a lot over the years, obviously. Um, and we've got, uh, we actually have new implants that have special coating on the back of them that help those implants grow into bone. Um, so every surgeon has their own protocol for after um, surgery, but I usually keep my patients off of it two to four weeks afterwards to allow for that bony ingrowth to happen. And then you can actually start to stress it as much as you need to and want to. Wow. Um, I mean, I, I tell everybody after an ankle replacement or any ankle surgery to truly give it a year because it can take that long for you to feel back to normal again. Right, right. Here's another question from the audience. After a foot and ankle surgery, what is the biggest mistake people make that delays recovery? 
uh, not listening to your surgeon, I would say. <laughs> that's that's probably my biggest pet peeve is if I told somebody to not walk on their foot. Um, so let's say after a fusion type surgery, um, most surgeons are going to keep you off of that foot for a minimum of six weeks. Um, and when I say off of it, I mean off of it, uh, using like a rolling scooter, um, a walker, if you can get around with that or crutches. Um, and the most I ever want on the foot is kind of a toe touch feel where you're just really setting it down for maybe a little bit of balance, but that's it. Okay. okay. Um, so I've heard over the course of my medical career that sometimes you should use ice. Sometimes you should use heat. Is there any mm -hmm. guidance on uh, what's the difference between using ice? and heat for a foot or ankle injury? Yeah, um, so your your ice is gonna be better for your more acute injuries. So within like the first two, well, honestly, after the injury initially occurs, but then within the first couple of weeks, that's when I want patients usually using more of the ice. So the ice um, helps uh, honestly decrease blood flow because it constricts the vessels so it can prevent some of the swelling that's gonna happen. It also helps as pain relief because it actually helps to kind of numb the area. Mm -hmm. Uh, heat and warming up and things like that are going to be better for prior to any sort of activity that you do. Uh, so just making sure you're nice and loose and limber and you can even put some kind of warm or moist heat on the or drier moist heat on the area uh, before you do any sort of exercise. Well, that's good they use that a lot in physical therapy with warming up muscles and things before they really test them. So great. Good advice. What exercises help prevent uh, injuring my feet and ankle? I would say the most important thing is if, if you don't have any underlying actual instability or any um, uh, deformity to the ankle or foot, um, just keeping the lower legs and actually the entire lower, the entire lower leg, not just the calf muscles strong. Um, so there's a couple muscles and tendons on the outside part of the ankle that are kind of secondary stabilizers to the ankle. So should somebody start to roll their ankle, they're the ones that actually pull the foot back outwards. So keeping those muscles on the outside part of the leg are, are very strong to preventing, especially like ankle sprains. Um, but the more you can do, I mean, as just in general, keeping in good physical condition, uh, gentle weightlifting, if you're allowed to do so by your, by your physician and just keeping your muscles and things around the ankle and foot are strong are very important. Great. Great advice. Mm -hmm. What types of shoes should I never wear? And <laughs> why should people not wear flip-flops? Why should people not wear flip-flops? My gosh. Um, because I think uh, every person under the age of 30 yeah. from, from May mm -hmm. until September wears. Well, yeah, of course, because they're most comfortable. I'll be very honest. If, if a person does not have any significant deformity or an underlying issue that I can actually see in their foot, um, I tell people to wear whatever shoes most comfortable. Um, if you do have an actual flat foot deformity, let's say, let's, it's very important to wear supportive shoes. Uh, a good walking shoe is usually a good um, option for you because it's going to have a little bit of a stiffer sole and almost create that kind of rocker bottom effect. Um, and then a, and sometimes an appropriate insert or a wedge if you need something like that to help balance the foot out some too. Okay, great. Okay, we have one last question from the audience. What is the difference between a custom orthotic and an over-the-counter shoe insert? Yeah, sure. Um, so kind of when I was talking about those diabetic, the diabetic foot deformity on that last slide, uh, those are going to be more for people who have actual deformity or they're going to be at risk of getting um, uh, ulcers and things like that. So areas of pressure are things that, cre that create calluses, which can lead to ulcers, which can lead to infection and all the bad things, right? Um, and so people who have diabetes and neuropathy and a a noticeable foot deformity. I a lot of times send those to an orthotist to have a custom insert made so that they can cut out areas for the areas of pressure that they're going to see. Uh, in general, for most people, even with just a mild flat foot deformity or something like that, an over-the-counter insert honestly is going to be just a sufficient for them. Great, great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Yeah, of Walker. Course. We hope Dr. Walker's presentation today was informative and helpful. Please join us Thursday, September 22nd, for our next Lunch and Learn presentation, Bring Your Care Home with Vicki Landers, our Interim Director of North Kansas City Hospital's Home Health Department. Again, thank you for joining us and have a good afternoon.